Welcome to this second seminar um, of the Eat Erasmus Project webinar series of 2023. Um, the seminar is going to be presented by um, Dr. Dario Cecilio Fernandez um, and introduced by um, Professor Rafael de Miguel. Um, but before we start, I um, just wanted to point out a few resources that are um, from the project that would be of uh, potential use and relating to self-regulation. So if you go to the um, project website on eat-erasmus.org, if you go to the self-regulation and assessment link, that will take you to a couple of resources. The first one of which is a self-regulatory report that was compiled by the team, um, mostly authored by Professor Carol Evans. Um, that has a huge number of different resources in it relating to self-regulation and to um, the role of self-regulation in assessment. You can either download the whole um, report or you can use the different links on the website to access the information from different sections of that report. At the bottom of that web page, that will take you to a self-regulation framework for assessment, um, which is a framework we put together that uses the EAT um, framework to identify areas where you can bring self-regulatory activities into um, assessment processes. And so there's a summary there and you can either download it by clicking on the image or you can download it by going to this website and I'll put that link in the description of this video. So the various different elements of the EAT framework, there's a range of different sort of self-assessment questions you can talk about and also some things to think about for each of those dimensions of the EAT framework and ways of encouraging self-regulation within students. We'll talk more about that in the third webinar. There's also a whole load of other useful guides and things that we'll be developing over time as well. As ever, if you would like to be kept updated or part of the project, um, do please follow this link here or um, use that QR code. And our next uh, webinar is on the 12th of April, um, which is looking at that self-regulation competency framework and talking about ways you can use that in practice. So thank you very much. Here are all our various details, our email address, our website address, that um, QR code again, and our YouTube, um, LinkedIn and Twitter addresses um, if you'd like to follow the project. So now I'll pass over to uh, Professor uh, De Miguel and uh, introduce our speaker for today's seminar. Uh, thank you very much to everybody to be here with us. Well, it's one, four minutes before after in, in Central Europe. Uh, my name is Rafael de Miguel. I am Vice Dean of uh, International at the University of Zaragoza, the Faculty of Education, and I'm one of the, of the partners today. This webinar is hosted by this university. University of Zaragoza is one of the top 10 universities in, in Spain, and in particularly in, in education, in higher education. We are one of the partners of the IAT project, Enhancement Agency and Transparency in Higher Education uh, Practices. Uh, this is the project, it's uh, an Erasmus Key Action 2 project on the call of higher education and a project trying to facilitate the development, application, and under share understanding of uh, an integrative approach uh, to assessment using the EAT, Enhancing Equity Agency and Transparency Framework. So it's an integrated self-regulatory approach uh, conceived in origin by Professor Carol Evans. Uh, and, and also, uh, well, this uh, project uh, has like uh, four or five partners when the, the coordinator is the University of Cardiff and the coordinator, the main coordinator of the project is Professor Steve Rutherford. And also we have several partners like Eurogeo, the European Association of Geographers, the University of Bristol, Minio University and the University of Zaragoza, of course. And we try to implement like, uh, let's say four different uh, work packages in, in the project uh, proposal, a first uh, output or first work package about assessment self-regulation resources. 
So a comprehensive set of resources to support understanding of the integrated self-regulatory approach, more theoretical. A second work package based on case studies and training programs, so reports and publication on how to use uh, self-regulatory integrated approach, approaches to assessment. So it's the, the application or the implementation of this theoretical uh, uh, self-regulatory approach to our daily basis uh, assessment with our real students, the real teachers. So it's a case studies for the implementation of this model, of this theoretical model on our respective universities. The third one is about training resources, webinars, and we, we try to create a MOOC, uh, massive online course, uh, and like we are today in a webinars, in order to provide training materials to support the professional development of uh, higher education uh, faculty. And the fourth uh, item, the fourth uh, work package and output of the project is to create assessment standards and recognition and development of standards framework for assessment practices in higher education, for example, digital badges, recognition and reward for expertise in assessment, uh, using self-regulatory approach in higher education institution and so on. So uh, today, the, the, the uh, webinar, uh, is uh, hosted uh, by the University of Zaragoza, but the main speaker is Professor Dario Cecilio Fernandez. So the, 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 the title of his speech is Promoting Student Self-Regulation -regula Through Assessment Practices. So uh, Professor Dario Cecilio Fernandez is researcher at the Brazilian University of Campinas, at the School of Medical Sciences, but he has conducted experiments to better understa understand the declarative and procedural knowledge and how they interact, studying the use of progress tests as a tool to investigate curriculum intervention, as well as computerized adaptive tests. So I think he's a good expert on, on how to promote student self-regulation, we are uh, coming from different disciplines. This is something that also the, the EAT project uh, tried to achieve. So uh, not only implement this uh, self-assessment model and framework in education sciences, like myself, I am, I am professor in, of teacher training in geography, uh, but try to implement this model in the different fields of knowledge in sciences, health sciences, uh, technologies, natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities, and so on, an engineer. And I think uh, Professor Dario is a good example of how to implement these uh, self-assessment, uh, self-regulation practices in the field of uh, medical sciences. So Dario, the word is, the floor is yours. And thanks so much uh, for your intervention. And thank you, uh, everybody. I see from the chat, there's people coming from different sites from the, from the world. There are many from the UK, from Bristol, Newcastle, Dundee, Scotland, Norwich, uh, but uh, Glasgow, but I see, well, thanks particularly from the people uh, attending from Australia. I see from Sydney, from Melbourne, which because of the time di difference, and uh, also people coming from Istanbul, Lithuania and so on. So we are a very diverse and huge and wide audience. And I only wish that you enjoy uh, with this speech as we are enjoying with the implementation of the project. So thank you very much. Dario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rafael, for the kind words. Uh, I think this is a great project uh, to start with. And I think self-regulation as well, it's a, it's a way to go, um, especially when we are in different disciplines. Uh, we do have evidence in many different disciplines using self-regulated learning. The challenge though is using the same background. And I'm gonna discuss that a bit today with our field. 
Um, I would like to ask you all as well, if you could open the cameras. I, I have two screens and I like to see faces. I think we are just living, you know, the pandemic. We were all complaining about the students closing their cameras and all this stuff. And we do the same thing when we get in meetings or courses. So thank you very much to all of you that have been opening the cameras. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some of you, I, I guess. I'm not sure what time it is in Australia. I, I always get confused where it's more or less. Here it's just a bit past nine o'clock. Uh, so let's get started. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and just make the questions. If it's some more general questions as well, then I think we can leave to the end that we're gonna have time for questions as well. But if it is a specific point that I'm just talking about it, please feel free to make a question. Can everyone see my slides as well? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, right. yeah. see, that's one of the advantages of having the camera open. Everybody can log and I can see. <laughs> So uh, I'm just bringing uh, a first slide. Why should we focus on, on self-regulated learning and why this is important and sort of a hot topic? It's not new, it's something from the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. But what the research has been showing uh, is that students, learners, residents, or professionals that ha have high skills uh, in self-regulated learning uh, they do have a better performance. And we also know from the literature that an increase in their skills in self-regulated learning also leads to an increase in performance. Uh, there are some studies that demonstrate that academic achievement could be accounted by 85% of self-regulated learning. This will differ from field to field, intervention to intervention. There are a couple of reviews this uh, Digna and Butner is one of them. I'm happy to share all the literature in the slides after uh, the talk as well. That's not a problem. Uh, and more importantly, uh, self-regulated learning can be transferred from one task to another. And that's quite important when we are talking about, you know, self-direct learning, lifelong learning, and all these sort of things. This is I skill that we can apply in every task we are doing. So we have quite a lot of models. They do differ a bit and they do have different foundations and different theories. Uh, a review in 2011, that's 12 years ago, they reported 16 models of self-regulated learning. I believe nowadays we have way more. Uh, here I'm just presenting the main ones just by name. Uh, Zimmerman is probably the most famous one, it's the most used one as well. Um, his foundation is in, in social cognitive theory. I'm going to present a bit that's based on Bandura's work, and Zimmerman was a Bandura PhD student as well. Then we have uh, the Bockert's model. He, he brings in the goals and motivation. Uh, we have Win and Hatwin, which is information processing and metacognition. Uh, Pindrich, he brings again the question of the motivation and metacognition. And Ephiclitz, which is a more current model, but based solely on metacognition. So as you can see, they can differ uh, from being task specific as a metacognitive uh, skills so far and so on. Uh, this paper of pa Panadero is a really good review if you are interested to know the difference between the model, what each model brings uh, and adds to the theory. It's a really nice one because he gives details, he makes very explicit which model is adding what to the theory so far and so on. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking mainly uh, the Zimmerman model. 
but one thing is important to note is that most model, with the exception of the Fleet model, they do have a preparatory phase, a performance phase, and a appraisal phase. I, I sort of copy these words of the Panadero's paper because they do not represent any model, so I try to be a bit broad. Um, and the Zimmerman models work within this framework as well. So just to get started, what is self-regulation? Does anyone here know, want to give a guess? Write in the chat, just open the mic and talk. No, as you see, it's, it's just like students, they don't like to reply. Okay, so I will just introduce the formal uh, definition of self-regulation. And it is also important to note because we have so many different models, they do vary distinctly on the definition, um, but this is a very used one. And it's a very updated one, although it is from the 2000s. So self-regulated learning, it is a metacognitive process that has been defined as self-generated thoughts, feelings, and actions that are planned and cyclically adapted to the attainment of personal goals. And here there are a few important topics that we're going to go through uh, the presentation. One's about being a metacognitive skill and not necessarily related to the um, task itself. So for example, the winning the vintage model, they're very much based on information process theory, which does not lead very well with metacognitive strategies. And I think that's why they try to say that they are actually a more higher level of abstraction using like metacognitive skills than actually the information processing theory. Uh, we do adapt them all the time, so it is a dynamic process and it is related to goals. We need to have a goal and a clear task. Uh, and we also include emotions here about the feelings, the thoughts and the actions, everything is sort of included in this model. So you, you can see that the definition is quite simple, uh, but actually it can get really complicated uh, at the time. So here is just, uh, oops. Uh, this is the Zimmerman model. So the four thought phase uh, is the pre preparatory phase that Panandero calls. It's before the task. So what we actually are looking for is goal setting. What is the goal for that task? Is what students are planning to solve that task. We are also looking to the motivational beliefs of the students. Here I'm gonna emphasize a lot uh, during the presentation, the self-efficacy. And I hope later on it, it gets uh, why this is important. Uh, and then we have the performance phase, which is the task strategies, uh, self-instructions, uh, time management, so all the sort of things that you need to monitor during a task. And there is a very important topic here that I'm not going to highlight in my presentation, but what often happens is that the choice of study strategies are often not well aligned with the best evidence we have, you know, in, in science learning or cognitive science and things like that. And we do it that ourselves. So for example, uh, we read a paper many, many times until we understand the paper. That's sort of one of the worst strategies for learning we have. Uh, we just summary highlight and, and this has very little evidence that works. Uh, and then choosing the best, the, the best strategies 
uh, like for example, testing quiz and things like that, that works very well in improved retention of knowledge helps a lot with this process uh, of study as well, together with the um, uh, self-regulation. And then we have the last part, which is the self-reflection phase, which often is an evaluation of the, uh, the process and, uh, and how did you feel, how did you think the, the task um, was and what changes can you make for the future and things like that. In the end, I'm going to demonstrate how we actually can assess that and what is important to focus on the feedback as well. Uh, one important aspect of, of this theory is that it's really based on the agents of a person and that's based on the Bandura's work of agents, which people has a large degree of influence of their choices of what they are doing and all this sort of thing so we are responsible for our own acts um, which leads as well to what bandura described as human capabilities which one of them is we have intentions to do things we don't do it because we have to we actually have intentions to do to achieve something uh, we can plan that, that's the forethought, we can plan in advance and think what's going to happen if I do that or if I do that. Uh, there is the self-reactness and this bit here is where Bandur talks about self-regulation, the importance of self-monitoring and being able to adapt for future performance and self-reaction and self-reflectness. That's our ability to actually think about our actions, what they did, why we did that, and, and try to adapt for the future as well. Uh, and there are different forms of agents. We have our individual agents, so we are responsible to do everything, but there are times that we need a prox agents. So for example, I need the help of the colleague to do something that I cannot do. We call it this a prox. Uh, and then there is the collective agents, in which is a group of people trying to decide something that's good for the community, for example. Uh, this is important. Uh, we are not discussing today, but it's also related with the process of co-regulation and share regulation, which are processes of self-regulation, but when they happen in groups. And another important thing to keep in mind is that you need to remember that works in the 60s when we have, you know, a lot of behavioral framework, we, we, we still were dealing with a psychoanalysis and things like that. So there was an understanding at that time that the environment actually had the greatest influence of the person, in the, on the person or the other air around. And what Bandura had said is actually, we are everything influenced by everything. So we have our personal determinants that's influenced the environment, that's influenced the behavioral determinants, and we are also influenced by all these variables at the same time. So it is not a one direction influence, but everything influences everything. So when we think about the application of self-regulation in higher education, one of the things we, we suffer most here uh, at the University of Campinas is that we, we teach students how to be self-regulated, but what often happens is that the structure of the institution itself does not allow for them to be regulated. So an example is like we, we, we still have a, an assessment week. I, I don't know if you still have there most part of the work, but we still have it here. And there is a week that students, they do have like 16 tests in a week. So they, they're going to regulate themselves. They're going to know which teach ask the most difficult questions and they're going to study for that and leave the other ones to not study. So there is uh, a regulation process there, but it is important to note that the environment is actually hampering student self-regulated learning uh, because 
And what we are discussing now is how actually we can build a curriculum based on self-regulated learning as well, which I'm going to discuss a bit further. And, and then what we have, I'm just bringing here some things to, to look at. Uh, when we say the personal, I'm actually talking about self-efficacy, values, the values that people do have, they differ quite a lot, um, especially in countries, you know, like Brazil, Australia, uh, it's just huge countries with different cultures, backgrounds and things like that outcome expectations, attributions, all these sort of things are different from people to people and we do need to understand that. Uh, the behavioral choice uh, process, so the choice of activities, uh, we don't have any flexibility in our curriculum for students to actually choose what type of disciplines they want to have. They sort of have a fixed blueprint and they can choose perhaps two or three disciplines throughout four or five years of graduation. Uh, but we also have persistence, achievement, all these sort of things are important. And for the environment, we have the social models and that's an important role for the teacher. Uh, we have instructions, feedback, standards, rewards, all these sort of things that we can think how institutionally we can change that and help students to self-regulate it better as well. Now uh, here I'm, I'm talking motivation from self-efficacy uh, perspective. There are many theories of motivation. I know you are quite aware of that. Uh, but I'm bringing self-efficacy because it is a central concept uh, in the work of Banura. And we have evidence that self-efficacy is actually a better predict predictor to performance than many other motivational variables. So self-efficacy, it's the individual believes in his or her capacity capacity to execute behaviors necessary to produce specific performance. And this is so central because if students do not believe they can do that, they will not even try, or they will give up at the first hurdle they have. So the self-efficacy is quite central because of that, because it's the basic principle students need to have. And we assume that because students are, you know, in a higher education, a university or whatever, they actually have the purpose to be there or they, they feel capable, but that's not necessarily true. And self-efficacy as well, it, it's very context specific. So you can have a high self-efficacy for one thing, but not for other. Uh, and you can be good in self-regulated one thing and not for other. And what happens is that there is a relation between being a, having a higher self-efficacy for one task and having a higher self-regulatory skills for the same task. So there is this really, uh, relation. And what is important is that there are different sources of how you can feel capable. One of them is master's experience. You are doing, you are getting things right, you are getting feedback. So this is one way of achieving. The other is what is called vicarious experience, which is basically the observational learning. You are looking other people doing it, and then you can feel competent or, or not, you can feel capable of doing or not. And then there, there is the verbal persuasion, which is basically the feedback. We, we work a lot of with the feedback and of course physiological and emotional state so for example we we can say that yes i'm, I'm fine writing a paper i don't have problem in doing that but then there is a day one day i'm just sick feeling out of blue and i don't feel i'm capable of writing a paper that day uh, so the self-efficacy can change from general to specific because of emotional states and things like that. And we don't consider that very much. And I think COVID uh, 
I don't want to say that was a good experience to realize that because I don't think COVID was a good experience. Um, but I think COVID highlighted uh, the challenge of teaching students um, in which many of them had, you know, family members dying and all these sort of things, especially here that we do have a lot of vulnerable students that had to go back home living with their parents and they had to go back to study so all, all, all these sort of things are actually influenced this self-regulatory um, performance of students but also their learning uh, and then here are just some ways that we can actually improve self-efficacy and achievement so exposure to good social models that's basically teachers uh, where we are talking a higher education setting, to know uh, setting proximal and specific goals. The literature goes quite big. Um, so, for example, if one uh, loses 30 kilos in a year, um, what we actually do is we just put more close goals. So you need to lose two, three kilos a month. And then you just wait every month to see whether you're achieving that to make adjustment on your diet or on your exercise. So we know having uh, distance goals are quite difficult if we don't break down to proximal and specific goals. Um, receiving social comparative information uh, and, and here is one of the challenge because the literature shows that it's often indicated a favorable performance, but that not always happens with our students. So we need to be careful with the feedback. Uh, the self um, monitoring, uh, verbalizing aloud, there are quite a lot of evidence on the importance of that. And of course, self-assessment. How can we uh, use the self-assessment in a good way? And this is a very important and delicate uh, subject because often uh, what we see in practice is that people use self-assessment without any framework behind because the literature says, well, self-assessment is good. And they just ask, well, grade yourself or how do you think in performance without students realize what is the importance of the self-assessment. It leads to very poor reflections and, and, and poor ju judgment as well, which is the biggest problem. So I, if we don't work on the framework and then often related to self-regulated learning of self-assessment, we often lose the content and the importance of it and it just become another sort of usually measurement because students just say whatever they want. And it, it is important to note that it is also very social related, culture related. So, uh, and that's the same thing for goals. Goals is very American. I'm not sure how it's in UK, Australia, Spain, I know a bit, Portugal. Uh, but in Brazil, it's not very common to set goals. So it's very difficult to say to a student, please just set your goals because they don't know what that means. Because it, it is very American. In the United States, you go there, everything's about setting goals. Uh, and the same thing goes to the self-assessment. Students need to understand what is self-assessment. Um, here, it's, uh, I, I decided to bring a table because it, it reflects how Actually, we try to teach students, teachers, uh, in, the, in how we can actually incorporate uh, self-regulated learning and self-efficacy as well. So we always start with observation. We know that's a, a, a powerful tool. We don't use a lot explicitly, we, we, but it, 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 there's quite a lot of work showing that we actually learn general rules and things like that by observation. Uh, and then to know it's the phase of mimicking, emulation. They are ju just trying to, to replicate. 
and then it goes to the self-control until and then self-regulation so what we actually try to do is guide uh, students and teachers throughout this process during the courses so they start to move surveys observing ourselves then they we give some tasks for them to emulate emulate and they some guided practice as well and it is important that there is a self-efficacy for teacher and we know that teachers that have high self-efficacy they lead to a higher engagement with students um, there is a more positive relation to students outcome and also teachers outcome and often the instruction quality is higher as well uh, now let's talk for the last five minutes about the assessment there is a, a nice paper in 2016 that they they tried to bring the, the three waves of assessment in self-regulated learning uh, the first one was using self-reports measurement. I think everyone's very familiar with that, right? You just go answer a questionnaire and you get an outcome afterwards. Uh, the most famous in, in, in self-regulated learning, it, it's funny because there is no self-regulation in the name. It's called it actually motivated strategy for learning questionnaire. This is, I think, the most cited questionnaires for um, uh, self-regulated learning. Uh, the disadvantage of using these methods is that they are very general and they are not that reliable. And I mean reliable not from a psychometric point of view, but it's actually students are marking what they believe is correct or not. And we know there is a lot of bias on that. Uh, the advantage is that you can easily apply to all students uh, and easily get an overall impression of the, the student's ability in self-regulation. Uh, nowadays, there is more on what they have called online measurement that's more related to track measurements. Uh, so we trace students uh, doing a performance, for example. We ask them to think aloud uh, during performance, uh, all these sort of things. So we sort of follow them in vivo, whatever they are doing. We can use com uh, computers as well. There is a huge literature using self-regulated on computer learning. Uh, that's really good. They are quite time consuming, uh, but they do give way more information about the students than the questionnaires itself. Uh, and now we are in the third wave that's actually combining intervention and assessment, which I think is the goal of this project. Uh, and one example is using learning diaries. So you ask students to actually record diaries throughout a year about you know, their planning or related self-regulated learning. So they do have a task, how they plan, how they monitor, all the sort of that. And then you can follow them longitudinally. And the assessment becomes the intervention as well. So we, we don't need to worry about, you know, prompts that are giving away what we are assessing, because then they go, it's assessment. Uh, it, it is the intervention and not the assessment itself. Uh, there is, for example, dynamic assessment. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this concept. It's quite used for second language learning. Uh, and they have like uh, the metacognitive prompt and things like that. So they, they have sort of a well-defined task and they go with students through the task for several weeks making these prompts. Um, I'm quite fan of microanalysis, uh, and then depends on your context. It works very well for small groups, for individual activities. It's very difficult to do with a large group of students, so 
if you have a class with 80 students that you cannot break down in small groups, it's going to be really difficult to implement the microanalysis. But what we do is actually simple questions uh, about goal setting, strategic planning, self-efficacy. So we, we ask students, what is your goal for this task? How you are planning to solve this problem or this task or whatever? And do you feel capable of doing that in a scale from zero to 10 or zero to 10 or whatever? Uh, during the task, we have a self-monitoring uh, question. We, we decide a specific moment during the task to actually interrupt the students and ask them uh, how the performance is going. So you, you need to be very careful when deciding uh, this moment. But it's not mandatory to do as well. We can do it afterwards. Uh, but if you have a break point during the procedure, it's quite nice to do uh, this question because you get uh, rich information about. Uh, and after the task, we, we ask about the judgment of performance. So goal setting, strategic planning again, and the attribution beliefs. The attribution beliefs is important because many times what happens is that students say that the problem with performance was outside their control, but we know often that's not true. So, ah, I got that right for luck. We know that's not true. There is no luck about doing the procedure, uh, and we need to correct that uh, in students as well. So make them understand that um, if they got it right, it was because of their performance, their knowledge, and whatever. And so going back to the agents, this is the important aspect. And what we do that's quite important is the calibration, which is looking at the actual performance and the student's evaluation of the performance. Because what often happens is there is a mismatch on that. And that's quite dangerous for several reasons, but there are students that think they're good enough for the performance, but they're not. Uh, and that's not, they, they have to keep studying, training or whatever, but the other way around, it's a problem as well, because then the students could be doing other stuff, having social life, so studying other talks and whatever. And as you can see, uh, the micro is very much related to the Zimmerman's protocol, uh, the Zimmerman's model. Uh, nowadays, we have, I'm promising, I'm almost done. Uh, we're having the learning curves, which it's a combination of nomothetic and ideographic methods. So the nomothetic methods, they are actually uh, the questionnaires, basically. They are uh, regulate by norms in group level. And the ideographic method is actually understand the students in more depth. So the microanalysis would be a more ideographic method, whereas the questionnaires would be a more nomothetic method. Uh, you need a time series of, uh, of measurements. You can measure a lot of things from one year, two years, five years. Uh, there are some articles showing that you need a hundred measurement points which basically makes it impossible to have all that uh, in a five years time. Uh, and finally, feedback. We know feedback is the most important aspect of learning. We need to give feedback students. Uh, the reason in the end of the 50s, Skinner proposed the effortless learning. We know that's not good. So students need to make mistakes and we need to correct mistakes. Just learning without mistakes is really terrible for long-term retentions of knowledge and skills, whatever. And learning by, by oh, I misspelled that. Uh, learning by chance is when, you know, you try one thing, it didn't work, then you try another, and then you try another. So sort of trial and error. Uh, we know that's not very good for learning as well. It's one of the worst strategies of learning. So it, it is really important to focus on feedback. And then there is the seminal work of Hattie and Timberley. Uh, they do bring the discussion about content and, and self-regulated skills. 
and they demonstrated that through meta analysis uh, that, that having feedback on, on self regulated learning and process is much better than have feedback on content. Um, it also improves stress between tasks and the metacognitive skills. And here is just a nice article from Nico that he gives a framework of how to give feedback. Uh, and we, we often do not consider that that needs to be a student's language and we often don't do that. You know, I, I work in the medical schools and what we often see is just medical doctors using a lot of jargons that often students do not know what they mean and that makes it really difficult for them. We need to understand that we cannot talk about everything. We need to prioritize some points, two to three points, and go into details. Uh, we need to get a plan of action. Um, and this plan of action, it's always related to the self-regulatory skills as well, because we help students plan what they have to do. They have to monitor their change and they have to give you feedback about what they have done to improve their performance. So this is all related to self-regulated learning. Uh, and here Nico highlight also the idea of being transferable, which is the self-regulatory processes. Uh, we do have experience in doing some teaching of self-regulated learning. Well, there is a huge discipline for students. They can enroll um, as they wish to. Now we, we have been working with teachers. We are in the seven years with a course for teachers. Has been quite nice. But what research has shown us so far is that when you do an intervention with self-regulated learning, when there is a researcher, the intervention is better than when you have a teacher. We don't know yet why, probably because the research is very expert on that and the teacher may have just superficial knowledge about self-regulated learning, but it, it needs further investigation. And now we are striving to talk about curriculum design based on self-regulated learning. There are a few initiatives all around the world as well, working quite nice. Uh, and I, I hope this project also helps with thinking curriculum using self-regulated learning instead of you know, content, PBL or not PBL or whatever, but actually have a framework based on science and evidence of what works and not. Uh, and we do use this framework. So we always start with observation and go until self-revelation. This happens more with students because we have more time. Uh, for teachers, we often stop with the self-control, with the guided practice and things like that. But that's just a matter of times and encounters we have. And Thank you very much. Sorry that I passed a bit the time. Uh, happy to answer any questions, but I think Steve has some announcements before. Well, th thank you very much, Dario. I think uh, Steve, it's time now for, well, there's a lot of questions, a lot of thank comments you. about autism, about uh, technology, about uh, well, uh, assessment. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of, of you want to uh, ask any particular question to the to the Rio to the presenter. I think uh, well, I think the the floor is open to anyone who wants to intervene. We have at least for ten minutes because you know this webinar is one hour. It's from two to two in, in Central European time. So I think uh, if anyone, I don't see hands raised. Yolanda's question about uh, neurodiverse yeah. students was was really interesting. I thought. <clears throat> you there? I I'll, I'll maybe read it out. 
Yes, please, Steve, because um, I have lots of messages here. I cannot. <laughs> find it um, <clears throat> she'd say, uh, Yolanda said, um, do these strategies apply to neurodiverse students? So to what extent are students with, with autism or, or other neurodiversities impacted by these, these sorts of strategies? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I I didn't read any article about it yet. Uh, we we don't have a lot of neurodivergent uh, students at our university because we, we we don't have like a screening protocol for that or or anything. Um, what we, we do have, for example, with some psychopathology, so for example, depression, anxiety, and, and, and things like that. And with them, uh, it works quite well, but I'm not sure when uh, with autism, and, and I'm not sure whether there are research on that as well. I, I know it's a hot topic right now, but I'm not sure whether there is, I, I can look it up as well. Uh, Manuel had asked, um, who can be the best positive influences on self-efficacy, teachers or student peers? Um, I, I, I would say teachers, uh, because there is a matter of respect of opinions as well. So uh, there is a, a literature on feedback that they, they say when there is somebody that you respect, you are more likely to actually uh, include their opinion uh, on what you have to change. Uh, but that could be a peer as well. It's not necessarily a teacher, but it's more a level of respect. What we see uh, they is that respect it's often related to the knowledge part, to specific knowledge, and that often leads to the teacher and not to a peer, but may lead to a student that's one or two years advancing the course, so sort of a mentoring system with peers, but they are in different levels of, of the course. I wonder if I could ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> you were talking about um, the impact of motivation on self-efficacy. How do you think this relates to how students engage with the feedback that they receive um, on their, their work? Often we, we have problems with getting students to actually act on feedback that um, we, we share with them or provide for them. Um, so how, how do you think that sort of self-efficacy impacts on that, that ability? Yeah, so because um, self-efficacy is so core, if the students, uh, they don't feel able to do that task. So one thing is feeling capable of doing that. The other thing is caring for doing that task. Uh, and if they don't care, it's quite difficult to, to actually make them care. So th this is a, a, a different talk. But if students has a low efficacy for that task, we also need to work on getting the self-efficacy higher together with the, the feedback. So we, we do need to understand why they think they're not good sometimes because they are not good. And then we just explain, look, with practice throughout time, you're gonna get better with that. So that's the normal process of learning. Uh, but often there is a mismatch between what uh, students feel capable of doing in their own performance. Uh, that's quite dangerous when they actually think they are really good, but the performance is really bad. Because this is students that's probably taking more things to do without being able to do. We are just finalizing a, a study using simulation training in which we compare the students that are doing the task and the students that are observing the task. What happens after a week, they all get the same level of knowledge and the same level of skills. 
It's the same for both groups. But the self-efficacy differs. Who actually did the task feel they're more capable of those who didn't do the task at the first time. So just by doing, they think they are more capable of doing, but actually the skills and the knowledge necessary is the same. So this is quite dangerous for our educational process. Um, there's a, a comment from, from David. Um, I don't know if you're, you're still here, David, of, about the paradox of engagement. I wondered if you wanted to unmute and, and talk about that or? Oh yeah, thanks, Steve. I hope I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I just think it, some of this is I, I agree, and I, I think it's been fantastic talk, and it it's very clear how it all kind of fits together. I think, but for, I think I wonder what some students think. It's just depending on their prior experience of um, you know level three type qualifications and secondary education, they might in a sense not be expecting or want this. Um, so whether they, or, and I may not be fully aware of that, so it, it kind of needs, in a sense, some quite, I wouldn't say overbearing kind of curriculum design, but they, they might need to be kind of pushed into this a bit in a way, which which kind of goes against the spirit of it, you know, maybe by, in the way that students self-regulate, they, they kind of assert that they want more transmissive kind of um, forms of teaching, they want to know what the answers are and what the content is and how they can take that from the slides and put it into the essay, that, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, to me, that seems, seems sort of a paradox. Um, and I'm not, not sure what the answer is to that, but I just think it, it, it's an interesting tension. Yeah, the, David, I, I, I agree with you. And I do think this is very culture as well. So here in Brazil, it's very, uh, it is from our educational system that we give slides and all the information to students from the beginning of the education to the end. So when we propose something differently, they don't like it very, very much. Uh, what we have been trying to change uh, is the culture. So teachers are becoming more aware over here uh, because of the courses, of the development courses, um, about the use of self-regulated learning. Um, self-regulated learning should lead to increasing students' autonomy as well. Um, and that's quite important to, to realize. Uh, I, I'm not sure where you're based, but for example, in the Netherlands, the, the students that are in the Mets and they have 12 hours contact with students, uh, with teachers during the week and the rest of the times to do the activities, study and whatever, everything they have to do. Uh, here in Brazil, our students, they have like I don't know, 40 hours a week with the teachers. So they don't have any time to self-regulate it themselves because we do that for them. Uh, and in, in the Netherlands, it works very well, but it is something that's already adapted to the culture of having so little contact with the teacher. Whereas over here, when we say students to do stuff, they don't like very much. But one of the reasons might be because they don't have time to do it as well. If we have a 40 hours curriculum of teachers and students, when they're going to study, you know, when they're going to do other things. And so I, I do think it's more of culture than in the perception of students. And just uh, one point, we often focus a lot of our energy on students' perceptions. So we have these huge surveys, how students feeling the teaching is, but there are few articles that they actually demonstrate that students' feeling of learning, so how well they learn something, is not necessarily 
what they actually have learned. So, for example, there is some articles using uh, active methodology comparing with traditional teaching. And they demonstrated that students learn more in an active way, but the students who were in the traditional uh, learning environment thought they had learned more as well. We have that with so many strategies, uh, study strategies, for example, as well. So with the spacing effect, which is sp spreading the studying session over time instead of blocking one block away, uh, students that cram their, their studies, they actually feel they learn more than whether the students that space more. But when we look at retention, the results is outcome. So we also need to realize that perception of students not necessarily align with the best evidence for learning, if that makes any sense. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, it, it's it's uh, at the uh, the final hour. So uh, uh, shall I hand back over to you, Raphael? <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing else. I think we can wrap up right now. And thank to uh, all of you for your questions, your suggestions. And please, as uh, as Steve told, uh, there's a link in somewhere in the yeah in the. Uh, in the chat uh, about if you want to get uh, informed, to get updated uh, from our project. So you can send us, uh, you can fill the form. And uh, our next webinar is on 12th April, self-regulation competency framework, same time. Uh, you have the Evergreen, Evergreen link. So you want to, to check. I will leave this Zoom session open for five minutes. You want to review all the messages and so on. And thank you very much. And a fantastic session really helps links, uh, said Mark. Thank you to all of you and have a nice and um, fantastic day. Goodbye.